Today we're going to finish up uh, with uh, recurrent neural networks. So uh, as you remember, we've been talking about the case where we have a layer of neurons in which we have recurrent connections between uh, neurons in the output layer of our network. Uh, and we've been uh, developing the mathematical tools to describe the behavior of these networks and describe how they uh, respond to their inputs. And we've been talking about the different kinds of computations that recurrent neural networks can perform. So you may recall that we started talking about, uh, we, we introduced the math of, uh, or the concept of how to study recurrent neural networks by looking at the simplest recurrent network that has a single, uh, it's a single neuron with a recurrent connection called an OTAPS. Uh, that a recurrent connection has a strength lambda, and we can write down, uh, let's see, so uh, we can write down the equation for this, the response of this neuron without a recurrent connection as uh, tau dv dt equals minus v. The minus v gives a, it's essentially a leak term, so that if you put input into the neuron, the response of the neuron uh, jumps up and then decays exponentially uh, in response to an input h. If we have a recurrent uh, connection lambda, then uh, there's an additional input to the neuron that's proportional to the firing rate of the neuron. Uh, we can rewrite that equation now as tau dv dt equals minus uh, quantity 1 minus lambda times v plus the input. And the behavior of this simple recurrent network uh, depends strongly on the uh, value of this uh, coefficient 1 minus lambda. And we've talked about three different cases. We've talked about the case where lambda is less than 1, uh, where lambda is uh, uh, equal to 1, in, in which case this coefficient is 0, and when lambda is greater than 1. So let's look at those uh, three cases again for this equation. So when lambda is less than 1, you can see that this quantity right here, this coefficient in front of the v is negative. And what that means is that uh, the uh, firing rate of this neuron relaxes exponentially toward some uh, h infinity, uh, some, sorry, some v infinity. And then when the input goes away, the neuron, uh, the firing rate decays exponentially toward zero. Okay, so uh, in the case where lambda is equal to one, you can see that this coefficient is zero. And now that you can see that the derivative of the firing rate of the neuron is just equal to the input. And what that means is that the firing rate of the neuron essentially integrates the input. And you can see if you put a step uh, input into this neuron with this recurrent uh, connection of lambda equal 1, that the response of the neuron simply ramps up linearly, uh, which corresponds to integrating that step input. And then when the input uh, is turned off and goes back to 0, you can see that the firing rate of the neuron stays constant. And that's because the leak uh, is exactly balanced by this excitatory recurrent input uh, from the neuron onto itself. OK, so you can see that for the case where lambda equals 1, uh, there's persistent activity after uh, you put an input into this neuron. And we talked about how this forms a, a short-term memory of a um, uh, that can be used for a bunch of different things. It, it's a short-term memory of a uh, a scalar or a continuous quantity like I position or, uh, or uh, we talked about uh, short-term memory integration being used for path integration or for accumulating uh, evidence across um, noisy uh, over a, uh, long exposure to a noisy stimulus. Okay, so today we're going to focus on networks where this lambda is greater than one. And in that case, you can see that the um, differential equation looks like this. So if lambda is greater than 1, then the quantity inside the parentheses here is negative. Uh, but that's uh, multiplied by a minus 1. So the coefficient in front of the v is positive. So if v itself is a positive number, <coughs> then dv dt is also positive. So if v is positive and dv dt is positive, then what that means is that the firing rate of that neuron is growing. And in this case, it's growing exponentially. So that when you put an input in, the response of the neuron grows exponentially. But when you turn the input off, the neuron, the firing rate of the neuron continues to grow exponentially. 
okay, which is a little bit uh, a little bit crazy. You know that neurons in the brain, of course, don't have firing rates that just keep growing exponentially. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to solve that problem uh, by using nonlinearities in the firing fi curve of neurons. But the key point here is that that this kind of network actually remembers that there was an input, as opposed to this kind of network where the, when the input goes away, the activity of the network just decays back to zero. This kind of network has no memory that there was an input long ago in the past, whereas this kind of network remembers that there was an input. Okay? And so that uh, kind of uh, uh, property, when lambda is greater than 1, is useful for storing memories. All right? So we're going to uh, expand on that idea. In particular, uh, we're going to use that theme to build uh, uh, networks that have attractors, that have stable states that they can go to, that uh, depend on prior inputs, but also can be used to store long-term memories. All right? uh, we're going to see how that uh, kind of network can also be used uh, to produce a winner-take-all network that is uh, sensitive to which of two inputs are stronger and stores a memory of uh, preceding inputs where uh, one input is stronger than the other or it ends up in a different state when, uh, let's say, uh, state one, input one is stronger than input two and it lands in a different state when input two is stronger than input one. Okay, and we're going to then describe a particular model called the Hopfield model for how attractor networks can store uh, long-term memories. Uh, we're going to introduce the idea of an energy landscape, which is a property of networks that have symmetric connections, uh, of which the Hopfield model is an example. And then we're going to end by talking about how many memories such a network can actually store, uh, known as the capacity problem. Okay, so let's start with uh, <coughs> recurrent networks uh, with lambda greater than 1. So let's start with our OTAPs. Let's put lambda equal to 2. Um, and again, you can see that if uh, we rewrite this equation with uh, uh, lambda greater than 1, we can write uh, tau dv dt equals lambda minus 1 times v plus h. Uh, you can see that, uh, that the value of 0, that the firing rate of 0, is an unstable fixed point of the network. Why is that? Because if v equals 0, then dv dt equals 0. So what that means is that if the firing rate is exactly 0, that's a, a fixed point of the system. But if v is, deviates very slightly from 0, if v becomes very slightly positive, then dv dt is positive, and the firing rate of the neuron starts running away. Okay. So what you can see is if you start the firing rate at 0, and have the input at 0, then dvdt is 0, and the, and the network will stay at 0 firing rate. But if you put in a very slight, a very small input, then dvdt goes positive, and the network activity runs away. Okay? And so uh, now let's put in an input of the opposite sign. So now let's uh, start with v equals 0 and put in a very tiny negative input. What's the network going to do? So uh, tau dv dt equals v. So if v is very slightly negative, or if h is very slightly negative and v is 0, then dv dt will be negative, and the network will run away in the negative direction. Okay, so this network actually has, uh, can produce two memories. It can produce uh, a memory that a preceding input was positive, or it can store a memory that a preceding input was negative. Okay? So it has two uh, configurations after you've put in an input that is positive or negative. Right? It can produce a, a positive output or a negative output that's persistent for a long time. Yes? Um, is this assumption that a negative firing rate would be negative to 2? Yeah, so, um, so you can basically reformulate everything that we've been talking about for neurons that have uh, zero, um, that, that can't have negative firing rates. But in this case, we've been working with linear neurons. Uh, and, uh, and it seems like the negative firing rates are pretty non-physical, non-intuitive. But it's 
It's a pretty standard way to do the mathematical analysis for neurons like this, is to treat them as linear. But you can sort of reformulate all of these networks in a way that don't have that non-physical property. So for now, just let's just uh, uh, bear with this uh, slightly uncomfortable situation of having neurons that have negative firing rates. Generally, we're going to associate negative firing rates as, uh, as uh, inhibition. Okay? But don't worry about that here. All right, so we're going to solve this problem that these neurons have firing rates that are kind of running away exponentially by adding a nonlinear uh, activation function. Okay, so a typical a nonlinear activation function that you might use for linear neurons, like uh, you know, for networks of the type we've been considering, is a symmetric FI curve, where if the input is positive and small, the firing rate of the neuron grows linearly until you reach a a point where it saturates. And larger inputs don't produce any larger firing rate of the neuron. So most neurons actually have kind of a saturating FI curve like this, like Hodgkin-Huxley neurons uh, begin to saturate. Why is that? Because the um, sodium channels begin to inactivate, and it can't fire any faster than uh, the, um, uh, there's a, uh, time between spikes that's sort of the closest that the neuron, the fastest that the neuron can spike because of sodium channel inactivation. OK, and then on the minus side, if the input is uh, small and negative, then the firing rate of the neuron goes negative linearly for and then saturates at some value. Uh, and we typically have the neuron saturating between uh, 1 and minus 1. So now, if you start your neuron at 0 firing rate and you put in a little positive input, What's the neuron going to do? Any guesses? Yeah, it's going to it's going to start running up exponentially, but then it's going to saturate up here, and so the firing rate will um, run up and and sit at one. Okay, and if we put in a negative input, a small negative input, then the neuron, then this little recurrent network will do. Uh, will go negative and saturate at minus 1. Okay? So you can see that this network actually has one unstable fixed point, where if it sits exactly at 0, it will stay at 0, until you give a little bit of input in either direction. And, um, and then the network will run up and sit at another fixed point here of 1. If you put in a big negative input, you can drive it to another fixed point. And these two are stable fixed points. Because once they're in that state, if you, put, if you give little perturbations to the network, it will deviate a little bit from that value. You can, if you give a negative input, a small negative input, you can cause this to decrease a little bit. But then when the input goes away, it will relax back. So these are, this is an unstable fixed point, and these are two stable fixed points. Now, we, uh, we're going to come back to this in more detail later, but we often think about networks like this as, um, as sort of uh, like a ball on a, on a hill. Okay? So you can imagine that you can describe this network uh, using what's called an energy landscape, where if you start the system at some point on this sort of um, you know, valley, uh, shaped uh, hill, all right, that the network sort of, it's like a ball that rolls down the hill. So if you start the network exactly at the peak, the ball will sit there. But if you give it a little bit of a nudge, it will roll downhill toward one of these stable points. Okay? If you start it slightly on the other side, it will roll this way. Okay? And those stable fixed points are called attractors. And this particular network has two attractors, one with a firing rate of 1 and one at a firing rate of minus 1. Yes, Apollonia. Right. Um, the stable fixed points at the top graph, where do you say they were? The stable, the, the stable fixed point is here, because once you, if the system is in this state, you can give slight perturbations, and the system returns to that fixed point. This is an unstable fixed point, because if you start the system there and give it a little nudge in either direction, the state runs away. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, any questions about that? Yes? How is like, the shape of the curve of those points different based on what? 
Yep, so I'm going to get, I'm going to come back to how you actually calculate this energy landscape more formally. Okay? There's a, a very, um, uh, very precise mathematical definition of what this, of how you define this uh, energy landscape. All right, so this was all for the case of one neuron. All right, so now let's extend it to the case of multiple neurons. So let's just take uh, two neurons with an autaps. Uh, one of these autapses have a value, a strength of two, and another, uh, and the other autaps have a strength of minus two. So this one is recurrent and excitatory. This one is recurrent and inhibitory. So now what we're going to do is we can plot the state network. Now, instead of being um, the, the state of the network in one dimension, V, we're now going to have V1 and V2. So we're going, the state of the system is going to be uh, a point in, in a plane given by V1 and V2. Okay. And so now you, you can, by looking at this network, you can see immediately that this particular neuron, this neuron with a firing rate of V2, looks like uh, the kind of network that we've already studied, right? It has a fixed, a stable fixed point at zero, right? And this network has two stable fixed points, one at one and the other one at minus one, okay? So you can see that this system will also have two stable fixed points. One there and one there, right? Because if I take the input away, this neuron is either going to one or minus one, and this neuron is going to go to zero. So there's one and minus one on the V1 axis, and those two states have zero firing rate on the V2 axis. Is that clear? So now what's going to happen if we made this, this autaps have a strength of two? Anybody? Want to take a guess? Four, four, four right. Why is that? Because uh, like that will also have uh, stable fixed points at like plus minus one. Right. So this one will have a stable fixed stable fixed points at one and minus one. This will also have stable fixed points at one and minus one. Right. And the system can be in any one of four <laughs> states. Zero zero. Sorry. 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, and minus 1, 1. That's right. All right, so um, I just want to make one other point here, which is that no matter where you start the system for this network, it's going to evolve towards one of these uh, stable fixed points. Unless I start it exactly right there at 0, that will be another fixed point, but that's an unstable fixed point. OK, so, um, so this system. Well, no matter where I start the state of that system, other than that exact point right there, the network will evolve toward one of those two attractors. Okay? And that's why they're called attractors, because they attract the state of the system toward one of those two points. Okay. Yes? So are attractors determined by uh, nonlinear activation function? They are. So if this nonlinear activation function saturated at 2 and minus 2, then these two points would be up here at 2 and minus 2. So you can see that this network has two eigenvalues, right? If we think of it as a linear network, this network has two eigenvalues. The, the connection matrix is given by a diagonal matrix with a 2 and a minus 2 along the diagonals, right? So let's take a look at this kind of network. Now, instead of, um, instead of an OTAPS network, we have recurrent connections of strength minus 2 and minus 2. So what does that weight matrix look like? 0, minus 2, zero minus 2, minus 2, 0, right? Well, what are the eigenvalues of this network? Anybody remember that? Right, it's A plus B and A minus B, right? And so the eigenvalues of this network are 0 plus negative 2 and 0 minus negative 2. So it's 2 and minus 2, right? So this network here 
will have exactly the same eigenvalues as this network. But what's going to be different? What are the eigenvectors? The 45 degrees. So the eigenvectors of this network are the x and y axes. The eigenvectors of this network are the 45 degree lines. So anybody want to take a guess as to what the stable states of this? It's just, it's just this network rotated by 45 degrees, right? So those are now the attractors of this network, right? And that makes sense, right? This neuron can be positive, but that's going to be strongly driving this neuron negative. But if this neuron is negative, that's going to be strongly driving this neuron positive, right? And so the, this network will want to sit out here on this line in this direction or in this direction. And because of the saturation, if there were no saturation, if, there, if this were a linear network, the activity of this neuron would just be running exponentially up these uh, 45 degree lines. But because of the saturation, it gets stuck here at 1 minus 1. Or rather, yeah, minus 1, 1 or 1 minus 1. OK, any questions about that? Yeah, Jasmine. So, like, so like the two pitchforks are not like necessarily two networks. Like, they're not actually. Yeah, it'll be it'll be one in this direction and one in that direction. So. So why? Because this neuron is saturated. Because the saturation is acting at the okay. level of the individual neurons. Okay. Yeah. So they so each neuron will go up to its own saturation point. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So this kind of network is actually pretty cool. Um, this network can implement decision making. It can decide, for example, whether one input is bigger than the other. All right. So if we have an input, so let's start our network right here at this unstable fixed point. All right. We've carefully balanced the ball on top of the hill, and it just sits there. And now let's put an input that is in this direction, h, so that it's slightly pointing to the right of this diagonal line. So what's going to happen? It's going to kick the state of the network up in this direction, right? But we've already discussed how if the, if the network state is anywhere on this side of that line, it will evolve toward the fixed point. If the h is on the other side, it will kick the network unstable fixed point into this part of the state space, and then the, the network will evolve toward this fixed point. Okay, These half planes here, this region here, is called the attractor basin for this attractor. And on this side, it's called the attractor basin for that attractor. Okay, And you can see that this network will be very sensitive to whichever input H1 or H2 is slightly larger. Okay. So let me show you what that looks like uh, in this little movie. Um, so we're going to start with our network exactly at exactly at the zero point, and we're going to give an input in this direction. And you can see that we've kicked the network slightly this way, and now the network evolves toward the fixed point, and it stays there. Now, if we give a big input this way, we can network over, push it to the other side of this, um, this dividing line between the two basins of attraction, and now the network sits here at this fixed point. And now we can kick it again with another input and push it back. So it's kind of like a, a flip-flop, right? It's pretty cool. It's a little, um, it detects which input was larger, pushes the network into an attractor that then remembers which input was larger for basically as long as the network, uh, as long as you allow the network to sit there. OK? All right, any questions about that? Yes, Rebecca. Uh, sorry, so the basin is just like each side of that. Um, like that's right. That's the basin of attraction for this attractor. If you start the network anywhere in this half plane, the network will evolve toward that attractor. And you can use that as a winner-take-all decision-making network 
by starting the network right there at zero. And small kicks in either direction will cause the network to relax into one of these attractors and maintain that memory. Okay. Now let's um, talk about a sort of a formal implementation of a system for producing uh, memories, long-term memories. All right? And that's called the Hopfield model. And uh, the Hopfield model is actually uh, one of the best current models for understanding how memory systems like the hippocampus uh, work. So the basic idea is that we have neurons in the hippocampus, in particular in the CA3 region of hippocampus, that have very uh, prominent, a lot of recurrent connectivity between those neurons. All right? And so you have uh, input from entorhinal cortex and from the uh, dentate gyrus that sort of serve as the stimuli that come into that network and, and form and burn uh, memories into that part of the network by changing the synaptic weights within that network. Such that sometime later, when similar inputs come in, they can reactivate the memory in the hippocampus. And you recognize and remember uh, that pattern of stimuli. All right, so we're going to, uh, so actually, so an example of uh, how this looks when you record neurons in the hippocampus looks like this. So uh, here's a, a mouse or a rat uh, with electrodes in, uh, in its hippocampus. If you put it in a little arena like this, uh, it will run around and explore for a while. You can record where the, the rat is in that arena, record from neurons, and measure when the neurons spike, and look at how the firing rate of those neurons relates to the position of the animal. So uh, the black trace here shows uh, all of the locations where the rat was when it was running around the maze, and the red dot where one of these neurons in CA3 of the hippocampus uh, generated a spike, okay, where the rat was when that neuron generates a spike. And those are shown with red dots here. Okay? And you can see that this neuron generates a uh, generates spiking when the animal is in a particular uh, restricted region of the cage of its environment. And different neurons show different localized regions. So these regions are called place fields because they are the places in the environment where the neuron spikes. Different neurons have different place fields. You can actually record from many of these neurons and looking at the at the pattern of neurons that are spiking, you can actually figure out where the rat was or is at any given moment just by looking at which of these neurons is spiking. That's pretty obvious, right? If this neuron is spiking and this neuron isn't, all these other neurons, then the animal is going to be, you know, you know that the animal is somewhere in that uh, location right there. Okay? All right, so in a sense, the activity of these neurons reflects the animal remembering, or sort of remembering that it's in a particular location. It look, it's in the cage, it looks at the walls of the environment, it sees, you know, a little, they, they use like colored cards on the wall to give the animal cues as to where it is. So they look around and they say, oh yeah, I'm here in my environment, there's a red card there and a yellow card there, and that's where I am right now. Okay? All right, so that's the way you think about these hippocampal place fields as being like a, a memory. On top of that, the hippocampus, th these, th this part of the hippocampus is necessary for the actual formation of memories um, in, a, in a broader sense, not just spatial locations, but more generally in terms of uh, you know, life events. Right? For humans, the hippocampus is an essential part. Uh, it's an essential part of the brain for storing memories. All right. so. Uh, all right, so let's come back to this idea of our recurrent network. And what we're going to do is we're going to start adding more and more neurons to our recurrent network. All right, so here's what the attractors look like for the case where we have one eigenvalue in the system that's greater than one, another one that's less than one. If we now make both of these neurons have recurrent connections that are stronger than one, now we're going to have four attractors, right? Because each one of these has two stable fixed points, 
a 1 and minus 1. Uh, so here, uh, v1, for these two states, v1 is 1, and for these two states, v1 is negative 1. For these two states, v2 is 1, and these two states, v2 is negative 1. All right? So you can see Every time we add another neuron or another neuron to our network that has an OTAP, so every time we add another neuron with uh, another eigenvalue, we add more st possible states of the network. Okay? So if we have two neurons, we have, we have uh, one neuron with an eigenvalue with uh, uh, OTAPs greater than one. We have two states. If we have two, we have four states. If we have three of those, we have eight states. So you can see that if we have n of these neurons with recurrent excitation with a lambda of greater than 1, we have 2 to the n possible states that that system can be in. Okay, So um, uh, I don't know exactly how many neurons are in CA3. It has to be several uh, million, maybe 10 million. I don't know the exact number. But 2 to that is a lot of possible states. right? So the problem is that, so let's think about how this thing acts as a memory. So it turns out that this little device that we've built here is actually a lot like a computer memory. Okay? Uh, it's like, a, um, like a, a register where we can write a value. Okay? So we can write in here a 1 minus 1, 1, and as long as we leave that network alone, it will store that value. Okay? Or we can write a, you know, 111 and it will store that value. But that's not really what we mean when we talk about memories, right? We, we have a memory of, you know, meeting somebody for lunch yesterday, um, right? That is a particular configuration of, uh, of sensory inputs. Right, that we experienced. So the other way to think about this is this kind of network is just a short-term memory. We, we can program in some values, 1, 1, 1. But if we were to turn the activity of these neurons off, we'd erase the memory. Right? How do we build into this network a long-term memory, something that we can turn all these neurons off and then um, and the network sort of goes back into the remembered state. All right? You do that by building connections between these neurons such that only some of these possible states are actually stable states. All right? So let me give you an example of this. So if you have a whole bunch of neurons, n neurons, you've got two to the n possible states that that network can sit in, but we want is for only some of those to actually be stable states of the system. Okay? So for example, when we wake up in the morning and we see you know, uh, the, the dresser over there and maybe the, the, the nightstand next to the bed, we want to remember that's our bedroom. We want that to be a particular configuration of inputs that we recall, right? So what you want is you want a set of neurons that have particular states that the system evolves toward that are stable states of the system. So the way you do that is you take this network with recurrent autopsies and you build cross connections between them that make particular of those possible states, actual stable states of the system. We want to restrict the number of st stable states in the system. So take a look at this network here. So here we have two neurons. You know that if you had between these uh, uh, of these neurons to themselves, there would be four possible stable states. But if we now build excitatory cross connections between those neurons, Two of those states actually are no longer stable states. They become unstable. Uh, and, and only these two remain stable states of the system, remain attractors. Okay? 
If we put inhibitory connections between those neurons, then we can make these two states the attractors of the system. Okay? All right, does that, does that make sense? All right, so let's, um, let's actually flesh out the mathematics of how you uh, take a network of neurons and program it to have particular states that are attractors of the system. All right. So we've been using this kind of dynamical equation. We're going to simplify that. We're going to follow the, uh, the, the construction that John Hopfield used when he analyzed these recurrent networks. And uh, instead of writing down a continuous update, so that we update the, in, in the formulation we've been using, we update the firing rate of our neuron using this differential equation, we're going to simplify it by just writing down the state of the network at time t plus 1 that's a function of the state of the network at the previous time step. Okay, so we're going to discretize time. We're going to say v, the state of the network, the firing rates of all the neurons at time t plus 1, is just a function of a weight matrix that connects all the neurons times the state of the system, okay, times the firing rate vector. And then this is also, can also have an input into it. All right. All right. Uh, and, and here I'm just writing out exactly what that uh, matrix multiplication looks like. It's um, the state of the ith matrix after we update the state of the network is just a sum over all of the different, the inputs coming from all of the other neurons, all the j other neurons. And we're going to simplify our uh, neuronal activation function to just make it uh, into a binary threshold neuron. So if the input is positive, then the firing rate of the neuron will be positive. If the input is negative, the firing rate of the neuron will be negative 1. All right? And that's called a, that's the sine function. It's 1 if x is greater than 0 and minus 1 if x is less than or equal to 0. All right, so our goal is to build a network that can store any memory we want, any pattern we want, and turn that into a stable state. So we're going to um, build a network that will evolve toward a particular pattern that we want. And C is just a pattern of ones and minus ones, right? That describes the memory that we're building into the network. All right? So C is just a one or minus one for every neuron in the network. So Ci is 1 or minus 1 for the ith neuron. OK, now we want Xi to be an attractor, right? We want to build a network such that Xi is an attractor. And what that means is that uh, what does building a network mean? When we say build a network, what, is, what are we actually doing? What, what is it here that we're actually trying to decide? Yeah, which is the M, right? So when I say build a network that does this, I mean choose a set of M's that has this property. So what we want is to we we want to find a weight matrix M such that if the network is in stable state, is in this desired state, that when we multiply that state times the matrix M and we take the sign of all of, of that sum, you're going to get the same state back. In other words, you start the network in this state, it's going to end up in the same state. That's what it means to have an attractor, OK? That's what it means to say that it's a stable state. OK, so we're going to try a particular matrix. And I'm going to describe what this actually looks like in more detail. But the matrix that programs a pattern P into the network as an attractor is this weight matrix right here. So if we have a pattern C, our weight matrix is some constant times the outer product of that pattern with itself. Right? And I'm going to explain what that means. What that means is that if neuron I and neuron J are both active in this pattern, are both have a firing rate of 1, 
then those two neurons are going to be connected to each other, right? They're going to have a, a connection between them that has a value of 1 or, or alpha, okay? If one of those neurons is, has a firing rate of 1 and the other neuron has a firing rate of 0, then what weight do we want between them? If one of them has a firing rate of 1 and the other has a firing rate of minus 1, the strength of the connection we want between them is minus 1. So if one neuron is active and another neuron is active, we want them to excite each other to maintain that as a stable state. If one neuron is plus and the other one is minus, we want them to inhibit each other because that will make that configuration stable. Okay, notice that's a symmetric matrix. So let's actually take our dynamical equation that says how we go from the state of time t to the state of time t plus 1 and put in this weight matrix and see whether this pattern C is actually um, a stable state. Okay, so let's do that. Let's take this m and stick it in there, substitute it in. Uh, notice this is a sum over j so we can pull the i, the ci out. And now you see that v at t plus 1 is this, and uh, it's the sine of a times ci times the sum over j of cj cj. Now what is that? Any idea what that is? So the elements of c are what? They're just 1s or minus 1s. So cj times cj has to be 1. And we're summing over and neurons. So this sum has to have a value n. Okay? So you can see that the state at time t plus 1, if we start the network in one of these, uh, in this remember, in this stored state, is just this sine of a n c, but a is positive, n is just a positive integer, number of neurons. So this has to equal C. Okay, so if we have this weight matrix, we start the network in that stored state, the state at the next time step will be the same state. So it's a stable fixed point. Okay? All right, so let's just go through an example. Uh, that is the, the prescription for programming a memory into a Hopfield network. Okay? And notice that it's just, it's essentially a Hebbian learning rule. So the way you do this is you activate the neurons with a particular pattern, and any two neurons that are active together form a positive excitatory connection between them. Any two neurons where one is positive and the, the other is negative form a, a symmetric inhibitory connection. All right. Okay. All right, so let's take a particular example. Let's make a three neuron network that stores a pattern 1, 1, minus 1. And again, the notation here is C, C transpose. That's an outer product, just like you use to compute the uh, covariance matrix of a, of a data uh, matrix. Okay, so there's a pattern we're going to program in. Uh, the weight matrix is C, C transpose, so that it's uh, 1, 1, minus 1 times 1, 1, minus 1. You can see that's going to give you this matrix here. Right? So that element there is 1 times 1, that element there. So here are two neurons. Uh, these two neurons storing this pattern, these two neurons, uh, sorry, this neuron has a firing rate of minus 1. So the connection between that neuron and itself is a 1. Just the product of that times that. All right. Any questions about how we got this weight matrix? I think it's pretty forward. Okay. So is that a stable point? Let's just multiply it out. We take this vector and multiply it by this matrix. There's our uh, stored pattern. There's our matrix that stores that pattern. And we're just going to multiply this out. You can see that. 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus minus 1 times minus 1 is 3. You just do that for each of the uh, neurons. T 
take the sine of that, and you can see that that's just 1, 1, minus 1. So 1, 1, minus 1 is a stable fixed point. Now let's see if it's actually an attractor. So what it means when a state is an attractor, what that means is if we start the network at a state that's a little bit different from that, and advance the network one time step, it will converge toward the attractor. So let's put in, uh, into our network that stores this pattern 1, 1, minus 1, let's put in a slightly different pattern and see what happens. So we're going to take that weight matrix, multiply it by this initial state, multiply that out, and you can see that uh, next state is going to be the sine of 3, 3, minus 3, and one time step advanced, the network is now in the state that we programmed in. Does that make sense? Okay, so that state is a stable fixed point and it's an attractor. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. I'm just going to prove that C is an attractor of the network uh, if we write down the network as the outer product of this, uh, the, the matrix elements are the outer product of the stored state. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the total input onto the ith neuron if we start from an arbitrary state v. So k is the input to all the neurons, right? And it's just that that matrix times the initial state. Okay, so v, j is the firing rate of the jth neuron, and k is just m times v. That's the pattern of inputs to all of our neurons. So what is that? K equals, we're just going to put this weight matrix into this equation. All right. Uh, we can pull the Ci outside of the sum because it doesn't depend on J. And the sum is over J. Now let's just write out this sum. Okay. Now you can see that if you start out with an initial state that has some number of neurons that have the correct sign that over that are already overlapping with the map, and some number of neurons in that initial state don't overlap with the memorized state, we can write out this sum as two terms. We can write it as a sum over some of the neurons that are already in the correct state and a sum over neurons that are not in the correct state. Okay. So if these neurons in that initial state have the right sign, that means these two have the same sign. And so the sum over C, uh, J, V, J for neurons where V has the right sign is just the number of neurons that has the correct sign. And this sum over incorrect neurons means these neurons have the opposite sign of the desired memory. And so those will be 1 and those will be minus 1, or those will be minus 1 and those will be 1. And so this will be minus the number of incorrect neurons. So you can see that the input neuron will have the right sign if the number of correct neurons is more than the number of incorrect neurons. All right? So what that means is that if you program a pattern into this network, and then I drive an input into the network, where most of the inputs drive, if the input drives most of the neurons in the right, with the right sign, then the, um, then the inputs will cause the network to evolve toward the memorized pattern in the next time step. Okay, so let me say that again, because I felt like that didn't come out very clearly. We program a pattern into our network. If we um, start the network at some, let's say at zero, and then we put in a pattern into the network such that just the majority of the neurons are activated in a way that looks like the stored pattern, then in the next time step, all of the neurons will have the stored pattern. Okay, so let me show you what that looks like. Actually, um, let me actually go ahead and show you. Okay, so here's an example of that. So you can use Hopfield networks to store many different kinds of things, including images. All right, so 
This is a network where each pixel is being represented by a neuron in a Hopfield network, and a particular image was stored in that network by setting up the pattern of synaptic weights. Okay? Just using that C, C transpose um, learning rule for the weight matrix M. Okay? Now what you can do is you can start that network from a random initial condition, okay? and then let the network evolve over time. All right? And what you see is that the network converges toward the pattern that was stored in the synaptic Okay? Does that make sense? Got that? So, um, so basically, as long as the initial pattern is, um, has some overlap with the stored pattern, the network will evolve toward the stored pattern. Okay. All right, so let me define a little bit better uh, what we mean by the energy landscape and how it's actually defined. Uh, okay, so you remember that if we start our network in a particular pattern V, the recurrent connections will drive inputs into all the other neurons, all the neurons in the network. And those inputs will then determine the pattern of activity at the next time step. Okay? So the, if we have a state of the network V, the inputs to the network, to all the neurons in the network from the currently active neurons, is given by um, the connection matrix times V. Okay? So we can just write that out as a sum like this. So you define the energy of the network as the dot product, basically the amount of overlap between the current state of the network and the inputs to all of the neurons that drive the activity in the next step. Okay? And the energy is minus. Okay? So what that means is if the network is in a state that has a big overlap with the pattern of inputs to all the other neurons, then the energy will be very negative. Right? And remember, the, the system likes to evolve toward low energies. In physics, if you have a ball on a hill, it rolls downhill right, to lower gravitational energies. Right? So you start the, the ball anywhere on the hill, and it will roll downhill. So these networks do the same thing. They evolve on this energy surface. They evolve toward states that have a high overlap with the inputs that drive the next state. Does that make sense? So if you're, if you're in a state where the pattern right now has a high overlap with what the pattern is going to be in the next time step, then you're in an attractor, right? Okay, so it's... Um, so it looks like that. So it, this energy is just negative of the overlap of the current state of the network with the pattern of inputs to all the neurons. Yes, Rebecca. Um, so is the sum to say that there's overlap with the previous inputs? Is that sort of like the goal of the next time step and then it will evolve towards the connections? Is that right? Yeah, so the, the, only, the only difference is that the state of the network is this vector, right? And the weight matrix how that state will drive input into all the other neurons. Okay? And so if you're in a state that drives a pattern of inputs to all the neurons that looks exactly like the current state, then you're going to stay in that state. Right? And so the energy is just defined as that uh, dot product, the overlap of the current state or the state that you're calculating the energy of and the inputs to the network in the next time step. Okay. All right, so let me show you what that looks like. Um, all right, and so the energy is lowest. The current state has a high overlap with the synaptic drive to the next step. Okay, so let's just take a look at this particular network here. Sorry, I've rewritten this dot product as, so K is just M times V. Uh, this dot product can just be written as V transpose times MV. Okay. 
So that's the energy. Let's take a look at this matrix, uh, this network uh, here. 0, minus 2, minus 2, 0. So it's this mutually inhibitory network. You know that that inhibitory network has um, attractors that are here at um, minus uh, 1, 1 and 1 minus 1. And so let's actually calculate the energy. So you can actually take these states, 1 minus 1, multiply it by that m, and then take the dot product with 1 minus 1, and do that for each one of those states, and write down the energy. You can see that the energy here is minus 1, the energy here is minus 1, and the energy here is 0. So if you start the network here at an energy 0, it's going to roll downhill to this state. Okay? Or it can roll downhill to this state, depending on um, uh, the, the initial condition. Okay? So you can also think about the energy as a function of uh, firing rates continuously. You can calculate that energy not just for these points on this, on this grid. And what you see is that there's basically in high dimensions, there are sort of valleys that describe the attractor basin of these different attractors. All right? And if you project that energy along an, an axis like this, you can see that um, you sort of uh, take a, let's say, take a slice through this energy function. You can see that this looks just like the energy surface, the energy function that we described before for the 1D. Attractor, okay, the one, the the single neuron with two attractors, right? This corresponds to a a valley and a valley and a peak between them, okay? And then the energy gets big outside of that. Any questions about that? Yes, Shay J. Uh, that's the general definition, minus one half uh, v dot k. It really, it actually doesn't really, this, this one half doesn't really matter. It actually comes out of uh, the, the derivative of something, as I recall. But it's, a scaling factor doesn't matter. The network always evolves toward a minimum of the energy, and so uh, this, this one half uh, could be anything. Okay. All right, so the point is um, that, uh, that starting the network anywhere with a sensory input the system will evolve toward the nearest memory. Okay. Okay, and I already showed you this. Okay, so now the, um, a, a very interesting question is how many memories can you actually store in a network? And there's a, a very simple way of calculating the capacity of the Hopfield network, and I, I'm just going to show you the outlines of it, uh, and and that actually gives us some insight into uh, what kinds of memories you can store. Basically, the idea is that when you store memories in a network, you want the different memories to be as uncorrelated with each, with each other as possible. You don't want to try to store memories that are very similar to each other. Um, uh, and you'll see why in a second when we look at the math. Okay, so let's say that we want to store multiple memories in our network. Okay, so instead of just storing one pattern C, we want to store a bunch of different patterns, C. And so let's say we're going to store P different patterns. So we have a parameter, a, a variable mu, an index mu, um, addresses each of the different patterns we want to store. So we're going to store uh, 0 to P patterns, P minus 1 patterns. So what we do, the way we do that, is we compute the contribution to the weight ma matrix from each of those different patterns. So we calculate a weight matrix using the outer product for each of the patterns we want to store in the network. All right? And then we add all of those together. We're going to uh, essentially sort of average together the network that we would make for each pattern separately. All right? Does that make sense? So there is the... Uh, equation for the weight matrix that stores p different patterns in our memory. Okay, 
in our network. Okay, and that's how we got this kind of network here where we store multiple uh, memories, all right? Okay, so let me just show you an example of uh, what happens when you do that. So I found these nice videos online. So here is uh, a representation of a network that stores a five by five array of pixels, okay? And this network was trained on these three different patterns, okay? And what this uh, little demo shows is that if you start the network from different configurations here and then evolve the network, you start running it. That means you run the dynamic update uh, for each neuron one at a time. And you can see how the system evolves over time. Okay, so this is a little GUI-based thing. You can flip the state and then run it. And you can see that if you change those, now, I think he was trying to make it look like that. But when you run it, it actually evolved toward this one. Now he's going to he's going to really make it look like that and you can see it evolves toward that one. Okay? All right, any questions about that? So you can see it's stored three separate memories. You give it an input and the network evolves toward whatever memory was closest to the input. So that's called a content memory. You can actually recall a memory, not by pointing to an address like you do in a computer, but by putting in something that looks a little bit like the memory. And then the system sort of evolves right to the, the memory that was closest to the input. Okay? So it's also called an auto-associative memory. It, auto, it automatically associates with the nearest, uh, with a pattern that's nearest to the input. Okay, so here's uh, another example. It's just kind of more of the same. Uh, this is a, a network similar to this. Instead of black and white, it's red and purple, but it's got a lot more pixels. And uh, and you and you'll see the three different images um, that are stored in there. Okay, so a face. A, a world and a penguin. So then what uh, they're doing here is they add noise and then you run the network and it records one of the patterns that you stored in it. Okay. So here's the penguin, add noise, add a little bit of noise. So here he's coloring it in I guess to make it uh, and then you run the network and it, re and it remembers the Okay. Okay, so that's interesting. So he ran it, he or she ran the network, and you see that it kind of recovered a face, but there's some penguin head stuck on top. So what, what goes wrong there? Something, something bad happened, right? The, the, the network was trained with a face, a globe, and a penguin, and, and you run it most of the time and it works, and then suddenly you run it and it recovers a face with a penguin head sticking out of it. What happened? So we'll explain what happens. What, the, what happened is that this network um, was trained in a way that has what's called a spurious attractor. And that often happens when you train a network with too many memories, when you exceed the capacity of the network to store memories. So let me show you uh, what actually goes wrong mathematically there. OK. so. Um, all right, so we're going to do the same analysis we did before. We're going to take a, a matrix, and we're going to build a network that stores um, multiple memories. Okay. Uh, this was the matrix to build one memory. Let's see what I did here. Um, okay, so uh, in order for... Yeah, so, sorry, this was the matrix for multiple memories. We're summing mu, I just didn't write the mu equals uh, 0 to p. So we're going to program p different memories by summing up this outer product for all the different patterns that we're wanting to store. All right. We're going to uh, ask 
whether one of those, under what conditions, is one of those patterns, the C0, actually a stable state of the network. Okay, so we're going to build a network with multiple patterns stored, and we're just going to ask a simple question, under what conditions is C0 going to evolve to C0? And if, it, if C0 evolves toward C0, or stays at C0, then it's a stable point, okay? All right, so let's do that. We're going to take that weight matrix and we're going to plug in our multiple memory ma weight matrix. All right, uh, you can see that um, that we can pull out the Xi uh, out of the sum over J. And the next step is we're going to separate this into a sum over mu equals zero and a separate sum for mu not equal to zero. All right, so this is a sum over all the mu's, but we're going to pull out the mu zero term as a separate sum over j. Right? Okay? Is that clear? Anyway, this is just for fun. Um, you don't you don't have to like reproduce this, so don't don't worry. Okay. So um, so we're going to pull out the mu equals zero term, and what does that look like? It's uh, Xi0, sum over j of Xij0, Xij0. So what is that? That's just n, right? The number of neurons. We're summing over j equals 1 to n, number of neurons. I should add those limits here. So you can see that that's n. So this is just sine of Xi0 plus a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so you can see right away that if all of the, uh, this other stuff is really small, then this is a fixed point, right? Because if all this stuff is small, the system will evolve toward the sine of Xi, which is just Xi0, okay? So let's take a look at all of this stuff and see what, uh, what can go wrong to make this not small, all right? So let's zoom in on this particular term right here. So what is this? This is sum over j, xi mu j, xi zero j. So what is that? Anybody know what that is? What, that's a, it's a vector operation. What is that? Exactly. It's a dot product between the image that we're asking, is it a stable fixed point, and all the other images in the network. Sorry. And, and the muth image, okay? So what this is saying is that if our image is orthogonal to all the other images in the network that we've tried to store, then this thing is zero. Okay, so the cross, so this is referred to as crosstalk between the stored memories. So if our pattern C0 is orthogonal to all the other patterns, then it will be a fixed point. So the capacity of the network, the crosstalk, um, the capacity of the network depends on how much overlap there is between our stored pattern and all the other patterns in the network. All right? So if all the memories are orthogonal, if all the patterns are orthogonal, then they're all stable attractors. But if one of those memories, C1, let's say C1, is close to C0, then C0 dot C1, if the two patterns are very similar, then the dot product is going to be n, right? And when you plug that, if that's n, then you can see that this becomes C1i, right? So what happens is that these other memories that are similar to our memorized pattern, uh, then when you sum that, when you compute that sum, some of these terms get big enough so that the memory in the next step is not the word memory. Okay, it's a combination. All right? So what happens is, so the way the capacity of the network is stored. So you can't actually choose all your memories to be orthogonal, but a pretty good way of making memories nearly orthogonal is to store them as random. Okay, so a lot of 
uh, the thinking that goes into how you would build a network that stores a lot of patterns is to take your memories and sort of convert them in a way that makes them maximally orthogonal to each other. Okay, and you can use things like lateral inhibition to orthogonalize different inputs. So once you make your patterns sort of noisy, then it turns out you can actually calculate that if the values of Xi are sort of look like random numbers, that you can store up to about 15% of the number of neurons worth of memories in your network. So if I have uh, 100 neurons in my network, I should be able to store about 15 different states in that network before they start to interfere with each other, before they start before you have a sufficiently high probability that two of those memories are close to each other. And as soon as that happens, then you start getting crosstalk between those memories that causes the state of the system to evolve in a way that doesn't recall one of your um, stored memories. All right? and, and what that looks like in the energy landscape is when you build a network with, let's say, five memories, there will be five minima in the network that sort of have equal low values of energy. Okay? But when you start sticking too many memories in your network, you end up with what are called spurious attractors, sort of local minima that aren't at the, um, that that don't correspond to one of the stored memories. And so as the system evolves, it can be walk going downhill and get stuck in one of those minima that look like a combination of two of the stored memories. Okay? And that's what went wrong here with the guy with the penguin sticking out of his head. Okay? And who knows? That maybe that's what happens when you look at something and you're like confused about what you're doing. We don't. We don't know if that's actually what happens, but um, it would be an interesting thing to test. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, that's, um, so you can see that these, these though are long-term memories. These don't depend on activity in the network to store, right? Those are programmed in to the synaptic connections between the neurons. So you can shut off all the activity, and if you just put in a, a pattern of input that reminds you of something, the network will recover the full memory for you. 